Welcome to My Hometown, the program that explores clubs, organizations, businesses, and issues across Nassau and Suffolk counties and sheds light on the different towns that are making a difference. Hello and welcome to My Hometown. My name is Bill Horan and I'm here with my co-host, Nassau Community College student, Matt Leonard, coming to you live via Zoom and being socially distant as recommended. Bill, today we're going to talk to one of our competitors in the podcast space, but since they have an important message, I, I guess we'll let them get through our screening process. <laughs> the, the, this new podcast is called New York Gritty, and it explores the question, is New York City in a death spiral or will it mount an epic comeback from the impacts of the pandemic? I'm told that New York Gritty explores the resiliency of New Yorkers in this time of crisis. So let's find out more from our guest the host of New York Gritty, Steve Kastenbaum. Steve, welcome to my hometown on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, I have a a special connection with Community College Radio because that's where I started. I started uh, in Community College Radio at Kingsborough Community College in Brooklyn at B91. So uh, I love Community College Radio. I thank you. And already we have an alliance here. Yes. Steve, first of all, let's ask you how you've been doing through the COVID-19. Has it affected you or your family or your operation? Well, fortunately, and, and thank God, um, no one in my family uh, has been ill. Um, we uh, in my house have all been uh, here <laughs> since the start of the pandemic. Uh, so, you know, spending over a year at home. And uh, that includes my wife, who's working full time from home, my two boys who are, who have been in remote school from home five days a week. And um, at, at the start of the pandemic, I was working for Westwood One News, which is a national radio news network. And, um, you know, I couldn't leave New York. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't run for the hills as some people chose to do, but I wouldn't do. I wouldn't abandon my, my, my Brooklyn, which I love. But I also couldn't leave because I was uh, in, in, literally, I had a front row seat to the pandemic uh, here in in the peak of the pandemic. And I was reporting from it right here on the front lines, right outside my window uh, is Brooklyn Hospital. And uh, you may remember a viral video uh, that was filmed outside Brooklyn Hospital where they were unfortunately taking the bodies, the body bags out of the hospital and placing them into the back of, of refrigerator trucks that were parked on the street. So that was basically my viewpoint throughout the, the pandemic. And uh, I reported on it, you know, from here and on the impacts of, of the city, not just the people who were directly impacted by, by the illness itself, but of course, all of the different sectors of the economy of New York. And, and, uh, and that's when we started hearing this idea that New York might be dying, which, uh, as you know, Anyone who's ever written New York's obituary has been proven wrong, and New York has mounted many epic comebacks in the past, but we are certainly facing what may be our biggest challenge in New York City uh, since the financial crisis of the 70s. So I wanted to really chronicle that and see how it was impacting people across the five boroughs of New York and how they were dealing with it and what their outlook for the future was. So that's how I started this podcast. I was just thinking, I don't know whether to say you had a reporter's dream or a reporter's nightmare or both, because you're at the center of the action. But then again, since you're living right there, you can't get away from it. So there's no break that you can at least kind of clear your mind and come back to work tomorrow and go to the battlefield, so to speak, or wherever the action is happening. You're you're 100 percent correct. I, you know, I saw all of my friends um, retreating. Taking um, taking time away, uh, some of them left for months, and you know, uh, for, for me, reporting uh, for all of our affiliates at the time, you know, it was day in and day out, and and the weekends didn't really offer much of a break. We tried to um, try, tried to get away from it when we could, but you know, early on, it was as as you all remember, it was horrendous here in, in the city, and and so yeah, it was you couldn't step back from the front lines, so to speak, and it really was a war. But then when things started to ease up, when, when it started to feel, feel safe to resume some normal activities again at the end of May, then we had the Black Lives Matter marches here in Brooklyn, and they literally went right by my window. So the second major national story was right out on my doorstep. And on those first couple of nights when there were some violent confrontations between some elements within the protests and police, 
Um, that was going on right down the block. The smoke from burning police vans was wafting through my windows. So uh, to, to say that we, uh, you know, uh, we're in the thick of it here uh, is is a bit of an understatement in my family. <laughs> I really hope there's a book coming out because that, that sounds like, I mean, you couldn't have been better positioned or worse positioned. And again, I don't know which is the correct one or maybe it's both. So, <laughs> yeah, I did feel a duty to my to my um, to my craft and to my uh, uh, to my job and, and to to journalism in general to stay put and uh, report uh, you know what I was seeing and chronicling it. You know, I really felt like I needed to be here at the time. Matt? Well, obviously, from all that you were just saying, you've had quite the career in journalism already, even before the podcast. So tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Um, so I'm born and bred in Brooklyn. I'm a third generation proud Brooklynite. Uh, and I, I always say that Brooklyn is the mother country. Uh, and I'm fond of the statistic that one in seven Americans can trace their roots through Brooklyn, including Many people on Long Island, uh, and so I'm very proud of uh, being a Brooklynite, and, and uh, I stayed local here my whole life, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I went to Kingsborough Community College to start my, uh, my, uh, my um, higher education because I really wasn't um, set on any one career path, and it was a perfect fit for me because they had a program there uh, where you could major in broadcast journalism. And uh, they had a, a college radio station and all of the professors there were adjuncts and several of them worked at 1010 Winds. And one of them said, why don't you apply for a, a production assistant job at 1010 Winds? All of, all of the production assistants, most of them are part-time college students. And man, to be in the newsroom at 1010 Winds at the age of 19, who could, who could pass that up? You know, I, and uh, so there I was suddenly working a couple of days a week in the newsroom and, and one thing led to another and it led to a full-time position at 1010 Winds. And uh, ultimately uh, the next step in, in becoming a reporter, I took a little break and I was a disc jockey at 92.7 WDRE on a Long Island radio station, which was a new wave alternative at the time. Uh, but when I went back to 1010 Winds, they, um, uh, someone decided to give me a chance and made me the Long Island stringer, the Long Island reporter. So I worked out of the newsroom, the Mineola newsroom at the State Supreme Court building in Mineola for years covering Long Island before uh, I um, made it into New York City and started covering the five boroughs. But my first story on the air as a reporter was the blizzard of 96. And uh, I found myself on an, an elevated subway platform in Brooklyn trying to get into work. And suddenly the announcement came over the loudspeakers that all above ground subway service was suspended indefinitely. And I called the desk and I said, I think I have a story here. <laughs> and for the next, for the next four or five hours, I was out there freezing reporting outdoors uh, on the shutdown of the New York city subway system in the blizzard. And uh, from there, I, you know, I spent 10 years reporting at 10, 10 winds uh, covering um, some incredible moments in history in New York and, Sadly, I was part of the team that, that was there covering uh, the attacks of 9-11 and, and the aftermath of that. Uh, from 1010 Winds, I went on to CNN Radio, which was uh, an amazing experience. Uh, CNN, for many years, had a national radio network, and I spent seven years there and covered national and international stories. Um, once again, found myself covering a lot of disaster and a lot of um, real heartache and grief uh, when I went to covered the earthquake in Haiti. Um, and, and, uh, but I covered a lot of great stuff, you know, positive things too. covered uh, the elections in 2008 and 2012 when uh, Barack Obama was running, which, which meant I got to be a witness to history. I was at the 2008 convention and again in 2012, the democratic party's convention. So that was amazing. And then from there, uh, uh, when they dissolved CNN radio, I moved on to Westwood one news which was a national radio news network and uh, did more of the same, covered a lot of moments in history that, uh, that people will remember for the rest of their lives, both locally here in New York and nationally and internationally. Got to go to two Olympics, which was fun. Uh, in 2016, I went to, I'm sorry, 2000, uh, yeah, 2016, I went to Rio for the Summer Olympics and 2018, I went to Korea for the Winter Games. And uh, then as the pandemic approached, um, uh, you know, I, I was here, as I mentioned, covering that uh, day to day and 
uh, everything else going on here in New York and, and, uh, and occasionally touching on Long Island. You know, when the president visited Long Island several times when Donald Trump was out there, uh, I was there in the scrum amongst the reporters covering his appearances. Uh, and, uh, but uh, in August of 2020, uh, the parent company Cumulus Media, uh, like many other companies, was uh, suffering financially during the pandemic. And unfortunately, they shut down the radio network. And that's when I started having this idea of getting back into long form radio, which is what I was doing at CNN. And I was really upset, like many New Yorkers were, about this notion that people from afar were saying that New York was dead. How, Steve, dare, how uh, dare somebody in Miami say New York is dead? <laughs> and that's a perfect lead in uh, because we want to know. Uh, tell us about this podcast. Is that when the podcast came about? That's when the idea for the podcast came about. You know, I was uh, walking around in August. It was beautiful. It was sunny. So many New Yorkers were out and about. The parks were full and there was music everywhere. And all of these musicians who normally would have been earning a living uh, doing live gigs, they couldn't do that. So they were out on the streets and they were busking and they were earning money that way. And I thought, wow, look at this resiliency. Look at this perseverance. And I'm sure there were people like this in every sector of the economy, in every sector of the social fabric that makes up New York. And so I decided I wanted to uh, start a podcast and, and, and highlight it and talk about the comeback, which everyone knows is coming, but what shape, what form is it going to take? And will the New York of the future resemble the pre-pandemic New York or will it be drastically different? And that's what we're exploring in New York Gritty. Uh, through the lens of the people who keep this city's magic alive in dark times, the people directly impacted by this, the restaurant owners, the musicians, the taxi cab drivers, the people on Broadway, all of those folks, and trying to get a, a, a lead on what this city is going to look like down the road. You are listening to My Hometown on the Voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHBC. My name is Matt Leonard, along with Bill Horan. And today we are talking about a new podcast called New York Gritty, which explores the question, is New York City in a death spiral or will it mount an epic comeback from the impacts of the pandemic? Our guest today is the host of New York Gritty, Steve Kastenbaum. Steve, my next question is, why do you choose or why would you want to host a podcast like New York Gritty? Oh, I, I love that question. Um, so, so as a reporter, a majority of my work when I was reporting for radio stations, the, the length varied from 40 seconds to two minutes with recorded pieces. And if I was doing a talk back, a Q&A with a, an, an affiliate station live, um, I wouldn't have a nice long window like, like we have here. I would only have maybe five minutes to talk about a story. And you really only touch the surface of a story with those short time lengths. And uh, when I was at CNN Radio, uh, we started doing podcasting. And uh, I love long-form audio storytelling. And I love multi-layered produ produced pieces. Um, uh, I think there's a tremendous value to interviews like this, and I love doing them. But my, my love for long-form audio storytelling comes from bringing people to a location with the use of sound and putting people in the shoes of my interviewee. And uh, it takes, um, it takes uh, a lot of um, skill, I want to say. I'm not trying to promote myself, but, but you, really, you really need to learn how to conduct an interview a certain way in order to get people to feel relaxed and to talk honestly and emotionally about the situation they're involved in. And you really don't get that in the short interview where you're looking for, you know, quick sound bites to insert into your two minute or 40 second piece. You really need to sit with somebody for 40 minutes, 30, 40, sometimes longer than that to get real deep emotional stories and put the listener in the shoes of your interviewee. And so that's why I decided I wanted to get back into podcasting and I love the production work too. I really love sitting down in front of uh, you know my audio editor and uh, fiddling around with some music and some some what we call ambient sound, nat sound, you know the background noise, and you really letting letting a story breathe and not rushing it, which you often have to do when you're covering the news on a day to day basis. Steve, I have a side hustle listening to you, and I'm going to suggest it to you. 
Okay. Have you ever thought of renting yourself out like they do with these giant jumping things and that for parties? And what I mean is adult parties, because your interesting, your background, you've covered so many interesting stories already, mm-hmm. literally been in the middle or across the street from so many other stories that I think would be fascinating if I went to a party and I met this guy, Steve. Do you know he's across the street from the hospital? He watched this march. He was involved in this at the courthouse. I mean, my God, what you've told us already is like a, a quick overview of history of New York for the last 30 or 35 years. And uh, I'm sure we're just scratching the surface. So if you ever want to make a little money and rent yourself <laughs> out, what would it be? I, I don't know. It wouldn't be called speed dating, but speed meeting <laughs> for people. And uh, just to say they've met you, they've talked to you and a uh, fascinating background. Do well, you I do, you know, Bill. I do feel like I, I, um, a debt, I owe a debt to uh, uh, younger uh, people uh, entering this world of, of broadcasting, and and so I do actually go back to uh, whenever I have an opportunity to Kingsborough Community College, but also other other uh, schools, and uh, and and even my high school alma mater, and I love to talk to young people about what I do, and hopefully, you know, uh, help them along in their path. To, to getting to this point because, um, um, you know, we always need new storytellers to come up and, and, and to look at things uh, in a new way, you know. And, I think and, you just uh, made a mistake because Sean Novad, our station director, just heard what you said. So he's going to put you on his hot list and you're going to be talking <laughs> at Nassau Community Qu- College quite frequently in the future. I'm happy to do it. <laughs> Steve, what have you noticed about the re- resiliency of, of New Yorkers going through this period. What's your impression and, and take back? You know, I don't want to sugarcoat this. Uh, yes, New Yorkers have a tremendous amount of resilience, the perseverance. I mean, you know, as the song goes, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. Right. And so New Yorkers have to be gritty. New Yorkers have to be strong in the face of adversity because this city will eat you alive if you're not that way. And uh, New York is special and it draws people from around the world, uh, not just across the United States, who want to be here for the numerous reasons that make it a cultural hub and economic hub of of the United States and of of the country and of the world. Um, But the thing I learned is that, you know, New Yorkers are really struggling now like they never have in recent history, worse than they were during the financial crisis in 2008 and 2009 when a record number of New Yorkers were unemployed for a year or more. And, and this pandemic and the, res- and the shutdowns and the resulting economic impact are, are causing a tremendous amount of pain here for a variety of reasons. And, and people are struggling and, and saying they need help. And uh, the help that has come, they're grateful for, but it doesn't solve their problems long term. Uh, I'll give you an example with restaurant owners. Uh, you know, they're struggling. You know, the, some of them are earning the ones that have stayed open and many of them have shut down permanently. Uh, 140,000 people who work in the hospitality industry are still out of work right now. That's almost half the workforce in hospitality. Uh, they, the owners of the restaurants and bars have said, you know, we need rent forgiveness uh, because we're just not going to make up that lost income or we need direct aid to help us pay our outstanding rent that we have not been able to pay. Uh, And and some landlords have been able to come to the table and reduce their rent or do do these deals where they say, I'll take just a percentage of what you what you gross in sales each day until this is over. But a lot of landlords haven't been able to do that because they too have mortgages that they have to pay. And uh, the bar owners and restaurant owners tell me that the, the majority of the aid that they're being offered is just low interest loans. So they're digging themselves into further debt. They're, they're putting themselves into a deeper hole month after month with no expectation of being able to climb out of that hole. You know, when, when the pandemic's over and, and, um, and the clientele numbers return to where they were pre-pandemic, which everybody expects they will, they can't make up for that lost income. So on top of their daily, uh, their daily expenses, their business expenses, their cost of running their business, they're, they're going to have that new debt that they're responsible for, that they're on the hook for. And so, they, you know, they're hurting. They're, they're, they're being crushed 
by this mounting debt. And that's why a lot of them have said, I, I just need to close. I, 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 it's, it's either, either I lose my house when I can't pay off these loans or I close my business. It's a shame what we're going through, Matt. You are listening to My Hometown on the Voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. My name is Matt Leonard. I'm along with Bill Horan. And today we are talking about a new podcast called New York Gritty, which explores the question, is New York City in a death spiral or will it mount an epic comeback from the impacts of the pandemic? Our guest is the host of New York Gritty, Steve Kastenbaum. Steve, my next question for you is we've heard a lot about people leaving New York for for Florida, Texas, and other places, do you believe they'll come back or do you believe they're going to find permanent residency in these new homes? I am certain that a, a certain a percentage of those who left and hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers left at the height of the pandemic, and we've seen a lot of them come back. A lot of them came back in September when the school year began because they thought their kids would be back in school, but many didn't. Many stayed where they were. And I'm certain that some of them will not come back because there isn't a need for them to be in the office space anymore. You know, like Google, uh, a, lo- a lot of these companies are saying you don't have to come back until X date, which is far off in the future. And when you do, you can have a hybrid work schedule where some days you're at home. So, you know, we have to acknowledge the fact that New York is going to be losing some of its tax base down the road. And that's the big challenge for the next mayor. You know, Bill de Blasio uh, is going to be handing off a, a severe economic crisis to the next mayor because of the loss of tax revenue here in the city. And that's one of the things that we want to look at in, in New York Gritty. But, um, but there are others. That's the thing about New York. You know, New York has never stayed the same. You know, you put someone from 50 years ago in, in Times Square and, uh, and, and they wouldn't recognize the place. You take someone who grew up in my part of Brooklyn in Midwood in uh, the 70s, and you put them on Kings Highway in Midwood today, and it would look completely different. They wouldn't recognize it. So New York York is always changing. It's always evolving. And that's one of the things that has always attracted new generations of New Yorkers, people who become transplants, who come here and move and, and adopt this city. So I think that uh, our elected officials are right when they say that New York isn't going anywhere. People will always want to be here. The question is, how difficult will it be to be here post-pandemic? And, and I don't think anyone has uh, a, an answer for that question that can be counted on to be uh, 100% accurate down the road at this point. Steve, I, I know one of the uh, episodes you had on uh, New York Gritty was Let the Music Play. What was that about? That was the genesis for the podcast. You know, I was feeling great. Uh, it's, it's, that genesis started in the month of August, and I was out at Prospect Park, which is uh, Brooklyn's backyard, and there were bands everywhere, including a, a great jazz band, Wayne Tucker, which you hear in the first episode of New York Gritty, he's one of those interviewed, and people were out, people were living, people were smiling. That was what impressed me so much, that despite the masks, despite the social distancing on, on the lawns, the, the meadows in, in Prospect Park, people were out in really large numbers, and the sun was out, and it was warm, and it felt optimistic, and they were stopping. There were hundreds of people out there in Grand Army Plaza listening to Wayne, Tuck, Wayne Tucker's jazz uh, band, which I, I really implore people to listen to that first episode because the music is just great. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I, I felt really confident at that point that my instincts were, were correct, that um, at its core, New York uh, is full of hope and resilience. And that's what always gets this city through the worst of times, you know, I, I, I reported on New York bouncing back from that economic crisis in 2008, 2009, from, from, the, uh, from Hurricane Sandy, from the attacks of 9-11, from so many different crises that this city faced. And, and I felt that again. I felt that feeling again in August that we would bounce back. 
You're a great ambassador, by the way. I think New York City should hire you just for that role because you've been smiling continually through the show. And we can <laughs> see visually that you really enjoy what you do. You love Brooklyn. You love the city. And you're a person who's more than willing to give back as you're doing our show today and very proud of your college roots. So thank you very much. Matt, let me get back to you. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Um, Steve, you said earlier you're a third generation Brooklynite and you're obviously very proud of that. So how do you think New York will look in, let's say, a year, five years and for the next generation? I think that there's an opportunity here. And a lot of people have said this to me in their interviews to reimagine New York in a better way, whether it's in the restaurant industry and, and an industry uh, that has been really difficult to to maintain a foothold in like the restaurant industry, or whether it's taxi drivers who've been suffering tremendously because of the debt that they were buried under when they bought medallions and then, and then Uber and Lyft came into the market. You know, they say there's an opportunity here to reimagine their industry so that it's fair and, and more equitable for them. And they're, they're, they can go back to actually supporting themselves because they're struggling so hard. Uh, same thing in Broadway. You know, the people on Broadway who I spoke to, everybody knows Broadway is going to come back, right? But, you know, there have been these questions about diversity on Broadway and, and equity and what shows are they deciding to put on and what show, whose voices are being heard in those productions. So I, I hear this a lot. You know, how can New York become a better place? You know, there's this also this look at, at climate change and the fact that there's an opportunity here to change commuting habits and maybe have less of an impact on the climate long-term in New York City, getting more people to bike. We've seen an explosion in people using their bicycles to get around in New York City. And I, and I think that that's something that's, uh, that there's a vested interest in sustaining that. So I think looking ahead, New York has an opportunity to reimagine itself and build itself back better. And I think that there are a lot of people who want to seize upon that opportunity right now. Steve, I, I want to thank you so much and let our audience know that we've been speaking with Steve Kastenbaum. He's the host of the new podcast, New York Gritty. Steve, good luck to you and to your podcast. And thanks so thank much for being much. with I, us. I appreciate this opportunity. And if I can just tell uh, the listeners that uh, you can check out New York Gritty on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, any podcast platform, we're there. Just look us up and we really appreciate it if you also rate and review the podcast on, on the platforms that have that as an option. Thanks. I think anybody listening will have a great time and learn a lot. I'd like our audience to know that I'm Bill Rand. I'm here with Matt Leonard. We thank you for listening to this week's special edition of My Hometown. We'd like to get your feedback on My Hometown. Send your comments to whpc at ncc.edu. Nassau Community College where success starts and continues. Till next time, this is Bill St. James. And remember, there's no town like your hometown.